and thank you for joining us for another edition of Press Road. Joined, as always, by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Guys, it's spring. Lots of rain so far this spring for high school sports, but spring also means spring football, and that's where we're going to start with Ohio State. Of course, everyone in the nation looking to the quarterback draw, the quarterback race, so who's going to be the starting quarterback. But what are some other position battles you're looking to from Ohio State? Well, I think we'll all defer to Mark on any huge specifics, but I think I got to believe within the coaching staff, the offensive line is where they're really worried and where there's a lot of machinations that go on. You know, the quarterbacking, we all see that. The offensive line is the stuff that happens behind the scenes. And to me, the springtime is most important for those guys. And I got to believe that Urban Meyer and his guys are trying to figure that out as well. Well, I think the one thing you have going for on the offensive line is you've got most of that line back from last year. So there's just a couple of little, certainly the depth chart you're going to look at, and, but for the most part, the offensive line is in good shape. I think you have to look at receivers. I mean, you lose Devin Smith as well as uh, Evan Spencer. Two of you, you've got a deep receiving core, but certainly you don't look at that roster and really see anybody who can stretch the field vertically like Devin Smith was able to do. Evan Spencer was almost a classic possession receiver type guy who did a lot of things away from the ball. He was really renowned for his blocking. So I think receiver is where I'm most looking forward to seeing, particularly with Mike Thomas now sitting out the rest of the spring after a sports hernia surgery. They, they fully believe he'll be back and ready to go in the fall. So you're seeing a lot of guys in different roles with receivers, including Jalen Marshall, who Zach Smith told us on a Tuesday that they've moved Jalen Marshall out of the H-back role to the wideout role to get him outside, be able to play a little against press coverage. They fully intend to bring Jalen Smith back to the H-back position come the fall. But in the meantime, that's allowing Curtis Samuel to get more reps at H-back. So they're starting to see some things in the receiver core that maybe will pay off next year. You mentioned the receivers, and that's at least on the offense would be my point of emphasis based on what comes back and what they lose from a year ago, guys. But and you mentioned Jalen Marshall. I think you put him outside, work him on the edge. That just widens the field and makes a defense, you know, if they continue with that come the fall, it makes a defense just game plan and prepare just that much more for the inside threat of the running game of Ezekiel Elliott, plus the quarterbacks, whoever it may be in week one. I think it will be Cardell Jones at least to start out in week one. But, you know, who knows from that point on where Braxton Miller and uh, JT Barrett fit into the equation at the quarterback position also. But offensively, I would say just the receivers getting another deep threat to stress the field. Um, you mentioned Michael Thomas. I think he's somebody who could potentially be the guy to do that next season. But, you know, he's going to sit the rest of the spring. No major loss because obviously they're not playing anybody except for themselves, you know, in, their, in the spring game this weekend. My question is on the defense. Um, I mean, I think your front four, you're going to be okay. You do lose some up front, but you've got pieces you can plug and play. And having the return of Adolphus Washington up front is a big anchor, and Joey Bosa will help. But maybe with the linebacking core and into the secondary some, there might be some questions, but I think they'll be answered with ease. Yeah, I, you know, as far as some questions, I guess receivers probably, you're right, that's where the most, I guess, intrigue is as to, when they snap it for real, who's going to be out there? But uh, I, again, I, I think the line play in the spring is where really the most development comes. We just don't notice it that yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, I, and I see where you're coming from too, also Todd, for the line because Ed Warner is now the offensive coordinator. He's, he's still be the O line. He's still coach. the O line coach. He will still be down on the field during the games as well. There was some speculation whether he'd go upstairs to do the play calling, but Tim Beck, the new quarterbacks coach, he'll stay in the booth. Warner will stay on the field. Okay. I think you got some returning guys on defense that you like, for example, defense end, obviously Joey Bosa, cornerback Eli Apple, but some young guys are going to have to fill in on the other side mm -hmm. of the field, and I think that's where we're going to see some of the more interesting position battles. Speaking of position battles, though, Bowling Green, their spring game is this Saturday as well. Looking at Todd, <laughs> to defer to Todd <laughs> here, he's probably the most knowledgeable, but any, any interesting – uh, things we're looking forward to out of Bowling Green. Yeah, well, Bowling Green last year with new coach Dino Babers had the MAC champs returning and had an incumbent quarterback who was projected to be the player of the year in the conference. And he got hurt in the first game, missed the rest of the season. That was Matt Johnson, uh, James Kanapke, a kid out of Fort Wayne, filled in admirably. And they also had a transfer coming in from Texas Tech that was pressing for time. But just this week, Coach Babers said it's Matt Johnson. He's the man. So. Uh, they have their spring game this Saturday. The Buckeyes are on the 18th, but uh, that's kind of been settled. And really, you thought that's what would happen. I mean, Johnson took this team to a championship, so uh, that's really kind of what you thought would happen. Otherwise, Bowling Green offensively, 
Uh, it's an embarrassment of riches uh, almost across the board. They bring back almost the entire offense. Defensively, they did lose some pretty key seniors, but really a lot of young talent there. I think the biggest thing from Bowling Green to, exactly. of course, Taylor Royster. I think this year uh, what you're already seeing is the offense is that notch faster that Coach Babers talked about, that Baylor hurry-up style offense that he brought. You, the difference is noticeable already in the second spring. And you mentioned Taylor Royster. There aren't as many local guys on BG as there were last year. Heath Jackson and, uh, graduated. and Chris Pullman both graduated. But you do have Royster coming back, uh, Ponder from Finley Davidson, yep. Trevor Roop from Crestview uh, should be getting some reps in the secondary. Yeah, and uh, Trevor actually caught a pass last year. I can't remember what game it was, but uh, he got in the stat sheet. So, yeah, the, it's too bad we lost Pullman and Jackson, but still a, a few local guys with Bowling Green, mm -hmm. hopefully more in the recent in the future season. Aiden O'Connor so. getting a walk-on opportunity. I mean, we'll see what that transpires for him down the road, but another local another local player who's, you know, at least going to give it a shot and maybe try to play some college football. It worked for Chris Pullman real sure well. Sure did. Yeah. And for Taylor Royster. And Taylor. He was a walk-on too, yeah. All right, from football to baseball, opening week for the Reds and Indians and the rest of Major League Baseball. So will the Reds make the playoffs or be over 500? Let's start with that. Will the Reds be over 500? Well, I, you know, Forecasting I'd, four months from now. I'd, five I'd, from I'd now. say they could be over 500. If I had to say, will they make the playoffs, you make me pick absolutely, I would say probably not. But I, it does amaze me how quickly the – Conventional wisdom has turned on the Reds. Each of the last three or four years, everybody has said they've got the talent to do it, and you know they get rid of Matt Latos and Joey Votto didn't play at all last year, and all of a sudden the Reds are last place team in the National League Central. I'm not buying that either. You can't. I don't care what the Cubs did. I mean, I look at the Brewers. You can't tell me they're that much better than the Reds. I think this is a very even division with the Cardinals being the best team, and everybody's got to try to catch them. I see a lot of parity. I think the Reds can be competitive, and I, I just hope that they're having a good enough season at the trade deadline they don't go into fire sale mode with Johnny Cueto because I'd like to see him be able to pitch a full season for the Reds. If they trade him at the deadline, they'll get fleeced anyway. So let's hope he stays around for the whole season. I wrote about that this week uh, with 419sports.com, and I, I thought that the most intriguing division is the NL Central yeah. just because there is so much parity. Yeah, it, it seems that the Cubs have upgraded majorly, especially with Lester. Granted, they did not get a, their best performance from Lester on Sunday night, but I didn't expect them to get that from him either, a guy who did not pitch a whole lot in the spring. He's still finding the lay of the land with this organization and as the season, especially this first month goes, with the National League in general. Granted, he's going to see St. Louis a bunch more. He'll see the Reds. He'll see Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, and the like. But I think he, all the teams really did step up. Uh, Harrison re-signing on Wednesday with, uh, with Pittsburgh getting in a contract extension there, uh, you know, locking him in long term. I think St. Louis, though, is the class of the division. And then, you know, it's going to be St. Louis, and then everybody else is just going to peck and, peck and claw at each other throughout the season. I think the Reds are going to struggle to get to 500, to tell you the truth. I, I think you look at their lineup, you look at their, particularly their pitching staff, I don't see the depth in the staff. I think they're, it's a very brittle lineup. It's been very injury prone, and you're getting to the point with, certainly with Brandon Phillips, with, with Votto, and, and Bruce is starting to edge up there too, that there's no longer development. Votto and Bruce are what they are at this point, and they're also starting to reach the point where they're going to start declining. Brandon Phillips, I think, has already begun to decline. I think Devin Mazzarocco is due to have a little bit of a comeback year, meaning he'll come back, regress back to the norm. And the, the beating any major league catcher takes has to be something you have to keep in mind with Devin Mazzarocco. If he's going to be able to stay healthy this entire season, maybe he'll have a good offensive year. But I, I think things are going to catch up with Mazzarocco this year. I don't know how the Reds are going to score a lot of runs. I just, I just see too many holes in the lineup, not enough depth in the pitching staff. And, and we know the concerns we have about the bullpen. Yeah, I, I, and the concerns are well-founded. I, I do think that uh, Phillips is certainly on the decline part of his career. Uh, I, I think Bruce, that was kind of fluky. They should have taken care of that better. He would have had a better season if he would have gotten it fixed and let it heal instead of coming back. I think Votto is a man on a mission. The, the pitching could be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, even when Homer comes back, beyond their first three, you got a lot of questions. The bullpen could be a trash fire. It, it could be bad. <laughs> not except, quite dumpster fire status yeah, yet. It, not yet. <laughs> but it could, beyond Chapman, I, I got a lot of questions. Yeah. But You want a dumpster fire, go get Valverde. <laughs> He's available. They, the bullpen could get better if when they get Homer back, one of those other guys is able to go in the pen mm -hmm. and can do better as a relief pitcher. Do you think maybe so. Singrani would, would Singr be, go back, would I'm be there long term? I'm intrigued with Singrani. I mm -hmm. think he will be there long term because 
I think he's better suited to the bullpen. When he was a starter, he seemed to run out of gas too quickly. I think he's got good stuff. I think they should leave him in the bullpen. Reason I asked that is I watched the final, uh, watched his last performance against Milwaukee in spring training, and I just watching it, it just he felt it looked more comfortable yeah. had he been in a pen roll, whereas the game has developed that he can kind of survey the lay of the land yeah. and go. 76 wins last season, so to get to 500, you got to improve five game, five, turn five L's to W's. I just think if they stay healthy, they can do that, but you guys gave a lot of good reasons for possibly not, so we'll see how it plays out. On the Indians' front, I think their goal is to make the postseason this year. Is that going to happen? Hey, the SI, SI's already crowned yeah, them. They got them as the World Series champs. So. They, they've crowned them. Yeah, we they how, are who we thought they were. We know how well that worked out for them in 1987. Yeah. Not well. I, <laughs> see, that is equally as puzzling to me as how everybody all of a sudden thinks the Reds are the worst team in the NL Central, hey. and it's not a question. All of a sudden, a lot of people think the Indians are yeah. the best team in the AL Central. I, I mean, I'm not down on the Indians. I've talked them up the right. last couple of years. But I, when I look at that pitching staff, I see Kluber, and I see a bunch of guys I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Trevor Bauer, could he be great? Sure. Carlos Carrasco? I mean, what are we talking Carrasco about Carrasco has had shades of brilliance, and yeah. he's had shades of Awful. dundrum. Yeah. And yet they reward him with a four-year contract this week. And Kluber, and you know, and if it works out great, Kluber locking him in for five years and thirty-eight million dollars. I think they got him at a bargain on this on the re-sign there. But it's the other pieces, the Danny Salazar's of the rotation, the you know, as you talked about, Trevor Bauer, and does this offense stay healthy? I mean, Nick Swisher, is he going to be? He's not. He's on the decline in his career, in my opinion. He's, he starts out the year. He's starting out the year on the DL. Can Carlos Santana play first every day and stay healthy? Can Jan Gomes stay healthy behind the plate? We talked about the life of a major league catcher. Look at Alex Avila and as far as health and concerns for, for a catcher. I still think Detroit's the, the class of the division, and I'm not saying that just because I'm a Tigers fan. I'm just saying it as a realist and looking at it. But I'm really, really intrigued to see how the Chicago White Sox start things out. With all the moves that they made, they were buyers in the offseason. They brought Jeff Samarja in to be a bona fide ace for that pitching staff. They haven't had one really since they got rid of Mark Burley. When you look at the brass tacks of the Chicago White Sox and you know Minnesota, they're not going to be anything special. But, but the other four are Kansas, really good. That's yeah. the problem that I think no. Kansas City into. solid. Yeah, you know they lose Shields from the, a team that went to the World Series. Cleveland is on paper improved, and the White Sox are improved. How is it going to transpire two, three, four, and five? I like the Brandon Moss signing. I think that's yes. going to help them offensively. But you mentioned the Carrasco and the Kluber extensions. I hope this isn't the case, but I, I can. I, my concern is whether or not that's going to hurt the Indians down the road, locking so many guys up, not giving them financial flexibility to make some moves. We saw how badly that hurt the Philadelphia Phillies the last couple of years and how the Phillies have gone just completely in and the And they can't get rid of any of these contracts. <laughs> Ryan Howard, prime example. Yes. So yeah. th that's my concern with the Indians. I, we've seen this so many times the last decade or so with this Cleveland Indians franchise where they've got fantastic second halves of the season, and then the following year, the first half, for whatever reason, things don't go the right way. They, in a funk in the first half, get themselves in such a big hole where that great second half maybe gets them back in contention, maybe gets them into the wild card. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they haven't been able to put together a full season of good baseball. If they do, maybe they do get in the playoffs, but I'm not counting on it this year. Another major storyline of this week is the pace of play initiatives that have gone into effect for MLB. How do you see these playing out? Have you seen an improvement in the games you've watched so far? Are they moving quicker? I think the, the empirical evidence to this point has been an emphatic yes. Now the question is, will they revert to old habits? I think one of the biggest things is you'll notice that clock at the stadium between innings and when there's a pitching change. Mm -hmm. I think that really will help because there's always been a lull there. And making batters stay in the box if they haven't swung at a pitch, I think is a great idea. It'll ingrain that as time goes on. I think it can only be positive, and it seems to be at least early on, it is having a positive effect. I think you hit the, the nail right on the head there. It's whether or not these changes will continue to be enforced right. throughout the season goes on. And, and a lot of that goes on to the umpires. Oh, absolutely. But, and, and as I say this about basketball officiating too, it, we always say it's on the officials. It really, it, it is, but it isn't. Because if the players and the managers don't like it and they make a bunch of noise, the umpires will be forced to go their way, just like basketball well, officials. Did you see the other night where Adrian Beltre stepped out of the box and half a second later realized he, he hadn't back and in. ran yeah. back into the box? That's good. They know that it's out there. You know, old, the old habits die hard. 
and it's going to take some time for these guys to get used to. And some of these guys who are like Mike Hargrove when he was playing in the human rain delay and, you know, have to fix both batting well, the gloves. The difference were... was back in his day, and for, for you youngins, we're talking about the mid-70s here, when Mike Hargrove did that, he was the only one. Yeah, That's right. why it was a comedy. Right. Now they all have their idiosyncrasies and their walk-up songs and I got to do this and fix my hat and make sure my sunglasses are on straight. It's a joke. Just stand in and hit. I got no problem with the, with the walk-up music whatsoever, for the record. <laughs> I love it. But, you know, it, you don't need to step out after every single pitch. Even if they throw to first, you don't have to adjust. Guess right. what? You're going to be fine. You're there because you've got some talent. You're probably pretty good at your craft. Speaking of old habits dying hard, Wrigley Field, a massive renovation to Wrigley Field. Jacobs or Progressive Field in Cleveland also with a big renovation. Matt, you were in Chicago Sunday night for the opener. What's your scouting report on the, the, the process of I renovating Wrigley? Notice the clock for the pace of play. That was great. And the renovations, they, it was rough because the bathroom, I, it took me two innings to use the restroom. And that was written about pretty often at, at the day after. So you weren't in the cup then? No, no, I did not use the <laughs> cup. I did use the trough. Didn't use the wall? The try, you know, I was trying to be respectful. But the <laughs> line, I was watching Lester pitch while on line. That's how far along the wow. line went. And wow. No bleachers, you know, pictures of Ernie Banks out there. It's, it's a work in progress, but... You know, still great atmosphere, obviously. At just, like, I'll let you, just like the team. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. I'll let you boys know in August how they've come along when I, yeah, when I go out there, there for the Motor City Kitties. Yeah. All right, you'll enjoy it, too. Hopefully they'll have bleachers by then. Yeah. They're they're supposed by to be the way, the, <laughs> the major renovation there is the Jumbotron, which right. I hadn't been there in a while, and I was pretty young when I went there. But, like, it's you only look at the jump, Jumbotron now as opposed really? to the, the scoreboard right next to it, the old-style one with, you know. We, we may be going in May as well one, with the wife being a Cubs fan. And we've talked about going out in May. We're definitely going in August when they play Detroit, just like we're going to go to Detroit in June when mm -hmm. the Cubs come in for the two-game set there. Um, I'm interested to see it, especially as it progresses. But, you know, bleachers will be done in May on, in left field. Then the right field area should be done in June, they're saying. And then everything else, you know, in the coming year, it's part of a four-year project. But uh, it's going to look a lot different, but it'll be interesting to see when it's all said and done. Yeah. Just as long we'll as – We'll get your report. As long as I'm not seeing a bunch of cups laying around, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I think that, that'll be done by then. Yeah. Let's just quickly close with the Cavs. Give me one word answer. This Cavs season is a success if? They make the finals. Make the finals. Make the finals. Win make the finals. The finals. I was going to say See win how the Mark finals. is? Yeah. He's I think they got to win it all, master. too. I think they got to win pros. it all, too. They're pros. Yeah. They, they, LeBron enough. came. They assembled love. You know, they got rid of the number one pick to bring love in. Let's win it now. That's my opinion. If you're in the playoffs, you might as well win it all. Yeah. Playoffs? LeBron's got a lot of. Enjoy the next two months of that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. LeBron's got a lot of miles on those legs, so we'll see how they fare. But thanks, guys, again. Another edition of Press Row in the books. Enjoy your weekend. Hopefully, it stops raining.